Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Book of Revelation. Dalton Thomas and myself have been just beginning to lay the foundation, some introductory sessions on the Book of Revelation. Uh, as I said, this is the fourth session. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube or on the Praise the Lord Network or uh, any number of um, platforms, be sure to go to your app store and download the Frontier Alliance International app where you can watch all of these sessions as well as a host of other fantastic uh, material there. You've got podcasts, TV shows, movies, films, sermons, notes, books, all kinds of stuff. Okay, so as I said, Dalton Thomas and I have been laying the groundwork for the book of Revelation, and we actually haven't jumped into the text yet. Um, I know we're in the fourth session and we're still doing preliminaries. However, in light of uh, a lot of the emails that we've been getting, I actually, Dalton and I were talking, I thought it would be good to do a session where we discuss the place of the book of Revelation within the framework, okay, of what we're going to refer to as Jewish cruciform apocalypticism. Now that's kind of a mouthful. If you've not heard that term, just hold on. We're going to kind of tease it out and unpack it. But it's so essential. It's amazing how no matter how uh, introductory, no matter how much foundational groundwork you try to lay, it's amazing the degree to which so much of the church is actually really not uh, versed in the book of Revelation or even basic Jewish worldview. And so it's, it's very important that we do take the time to discuss this. So the title of this session is The Book of Revelation, The Capstone, okay, the culmination, the capstone, the pinnacle, sort of the end point of Jewish cruciform apocalypticism. So what we're going to do is in order to unpack this, again, fairly loaded term, Jewish cruciform apocalypticism, we're going to work through each component. We're going to start with the Jewish element, then we're going to look at the apocalyptic component, and then we're going to come back to the issue of cruciform. And what do each of these things mean? And again, why is it important to understand as we approach the book of Revelation? So we're going to begin with Jewish worldview. Now, in order to rightly understand Jewish worldview, what we're talking about is a biblical worldview, okay? We're talking about a Hebraic worldview. What is sort of... Uh, how does the Bible lay out a proper understanding of time, the unfolding of history? How does the Bible lay out the concept of just the totality of all things? What is creation according to the biblical or Hebraic mindset? And obviously this is something you could do a whole course on. We're just going to kind of do some real introductory information here, but it will really help us to understand the purpose and really the pastoral intent. Um, the uh, yeah, I'll just say the Lord's um, application for us today for the book of Revelation. It's really essential that we do this. So we're going to begin with the Jewish worldview. But in order to do that, we have to understand that we're... Oh, look, there's many different worldviews, to be clear. But the primary two worldviews that are largely going to be competing against one another within the Christian community in particular is going to be the biblical worldview and the Greek worldview. Okay, and so when, we're, when we say the Greek worldview, what are we talking about? And it's really helpful to do an overview of that, a brief overview of that, to help us understand the difference between it and a biblical worldview. And it's amazing when we do that, we begin to see the degree to which the Greek pagan worldview has really influenced and infiltrated uh, the church and the Christian mindset. And it's so essential that we break away from this, again, pagan Greek influence. Okay, so the Greek worldview, when we say the Greek worldview, we're talking about um, the, the Greek philosophical worldview. How did the Greek philosophers understand creation, the totality of existence, uh, you know, this sort of fishbowl or this, um, this field of play that we find ourselves on, the world that we're in right now? How does Greek philosophical worldview understand this? How does the Greek philo philosophy understand this? So in order to understand this, again, we begin by understanding that Socrates is really viewed as sort of the father of the Greek philosophical worldview. 
and then his student is Plato. So now Socrates is alleged to have lived, if he's real, um, in the fifth going into the fourth century. So we're talking about 400, he was born roughly 470 years before the turn uh, of the first century. And then you had Plato, and then of course you had Aristotle, and then you had all sorts of other different Greek philosophers. Of course, Alexander the Great was uh, a student of uh, Greek philosophy. And then, of course, if we just look at a map, it's, it's important to look at a map to understand that because of the influence of Alexander the Great, the project of Hellenism, okay, this was as Alexander the Great conquered the whole Middle East, I'll put this map up for everyone to look at, as he swept out of Macedonia, as he swept out of Greece or Europe, across the Middle East, he brought with him the influence of Greek philosophy. It was very much uh, an imperialistic project. It was not just to conquer for the sake of conquering, but he also brought with him Hellenistic culture and philosophy. Hellenism just simply meaning Greek. Okay, and so you can see the influence of that all the way down into Egypt, tremendous influence in Egypt from Greece, all the way throughout the Middle East. You talk to, uh, I was talking to some of my friends in the underground church in Iran a few years ago, and I was talking about the influence of Plato. And they were going, Plato? You mean our Plato? And I was saying, well, no, Plato's from Greece. And they go, he's from Greece, so I thought he was Iranian. They go, oh, yeah, Platonic philosophy is really uh, popular in Iran. You know, we're really influenced by Greek philosophy. And I was like, man, that's fascinating. I, you know, to think because of what Alexander did, the Greek uh, influence throughout the region still to this day is felt in the uh, really, you know, very eastern nation of Iran. And of course, Israel finds itself really right in the middle of all this. So here you have the Hebrews trying to live according to the worldview of the Bible, of their Bible. And then you had this imperialistic imposition, this import of pagan philosophy, okay? So Alexander the Great really being the final in a series of um, these influences. It's important, too, to note uh, when I say, because some, some people get a little riled up. They're like, hold on now, Greek philosophy is not as bad as you're making it out to be. We could talk about that all day. But I want to just throw in one little uh, interesting bit of trivia. Socrates, again, the father of all these uh, philosophers, he claimed specifically divine inspiration from a being that he referred to as a demon. And he used the Greek word daimonion, okay? It's basically the same word as demon. He claims to have been inspired by a spirit, by a demon. Now, um, he believed this spirit was sort of like this, um, he didn't believe it was an evil spirit, but he did believe it was sort of this semi, semi-god or demi-god spirit, this sort of intermediary spirit. And he called it again a daimonion. Um, Tertullian, interestingly, one of the early church writers in his book, A Treatise of the Soul, he said this, Socrates, as none can doubt, operated by a different spirit, for they say that a demon clave to him from his boyhood. Okay, so it's interesting. A lot of people aren't aware of this. I mean, in the same way, we could look at Muhammad, we could look at Joseph Smith, we could look at some of their experience and say, what is it that led to them being such profound fathers of such vast movements, of religious movements, of movements of thought, of ideological or philosophical thought, well, Socrates, like so many other, we'll say, false religious leaders, was influenced by a demon. It's, again, worth noting. So I'm pretty big on charts and graphs. And so um, a lot of this, by the way, let me say, um, if you're really interested in this, I highly encourage everyone to get a book by my good friend John Harrigan. In fact, I carry it on my website. And the name of the book is The Gospel of Christ Crucified. Okay, you can also get it on Amazon. Um, I, in fact, I might even be out of it on my website right now, but you can get it on Amazon, The Gospel of Christ Crucified. John deals with these issues in great depth, okay? And John's also a big chart guy. So a lot of my charts I've kind of borrowed from him. So here's a chart, again, laying out the Greek or the Platonic philosophical worldview. And I've got there in parentheses, I say it's dualistic. What do I mean by dualistic? Well, essentially, here's a picture. Greek philosophy views the earth, okay, let's just say the earth. We're talking the, not just the earth, but the universe, the physical realm, that which is tangible, physical, okay, we're in the body. It views this as bad or lower. It's lower, it's inferior, 
it's less than, it's corrupted, it's bad. And this is where we are right now. But then it views the spiritual realm, which is the immaterial, metaphorical, okay? That's where ghosts live and so and spirits live. It views that realm as perfect. And there's kind of, mi of a mirror between the two. But the goal, the goal of life is to escape the shell. It's to get out, to, to be detached from the physical realm and to get to the place where spirits and ghosts dwell and that's where we attain perfection. But until then, we're bound by all of the, um, we'll just say in, from a biblical perspective, the sinfulness, the corruption, the brokenness of this age. But the goal is to escape the shell. So that would be just sort of a very simple, oh, very simple, but that, when I say dualism, it's this harsh, distinction between the spiritual and the earthly, dual, okay, two. The, there's the heavenly, the spiritual, um, again, the immaterial versus the earthly, the lower, the bad, or the material, the physical, the corporal. Now, I've got another chart here, which is a little bit strange, but the, the purpose of this chart is to define how Greek philosophy understands time how it understands the unfolding of history, okay? We're, we're on a timeline. What does it look like to the Greek philosophical mindset? Well, from a Greek philosophical perspective, it's not as though there's a starting point and we're moving towards some particular point in time, some culmination. Rather, we're just in the middle of this endless spiral. History is just kind of repeating itself. It's cyclical. It's going, and it's not moving toward anything in particular. I mean, you, you could say that it's moving forward. I mean, you know, we're advancing in technology and this type of thing, but it could reverse, and we could just. It doesn't really have any particular destination. It's just cycling through, and it's just moving forward. It doesn't really have an important beginning and a beginning end, or a beginning and an end. So that's important to highlight now. If you're old enough, you remember this really strange UFO cult that was in California. I want to say this was in the 90s. And they all killed themselves. There's a picture here of the leader. You can see some of the people. They committed suicide. They took, um, I believe it was jello shots with cyanide. And then they stuck plastic bags over their heads. And they all committed suicide. It was a real miniature Jim Jones, so to speak. Um, but what they believe, and the reason they did this, is they were a, some kind of strange UFO cult. And when, uh, I want to say it was the Hale-Bopp comet, it was this comet was sort of passing by the Earth. You could look up and see it. They claimed, or at least their leader claimed, that on the other side of it was sort of this mothership. And by killing themselves, they were escaping the shell. And interestingly, they had all, um, the men had emasculated themselves. Uh, neutered themselves, and they, they kind of lived as these monastics, as these monks. Why? Because they really did embrace a kind of Greek philosophy. The world here is bad. You need to detach yourself from it. Things that drag you down, such as your genitals, right? Like you remove that, and then ultimately they carried it through to, the, to its ultimate logical conclusion, which is you have to kill yourself to escape this body which is holding them back. They became, they, they viewed this as salvation. They literally referred to it as salvation. Killing themselves was salvation. We go, well, that's crazy, right? As Christians, we think that's horrible. That's crazy. Well, interestingly, I would say that there's a degree to which the church today has very similar ideas. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Now, it's interesting to note that Paul the Apostle specifically, to understand Again, after the influence of Alexander throughout the Middle East, the apostles living in Israel, under, still under the shadow of much of the influence of uh, just that prior you know, Hellenistic project throughout the Middle East. And of course, now they're living under Roman rule, but there's a lot of similarities there, obviously, between Greek and Roman uh, religion and so forth. But the apostles in the early church were specifically dealing with pastorally, they were wrestling, trying to teach the Gentiles the biblical worldview. They're trying to disciple Gentiles into a Bible-based worldview, and they were contending with the influence of Greek philosophy all around them, particularly over in Alexandria, in Egypt, which was one of the hot spots, one of the hearts of the early Christian church, and many of the early church writers uh, lived in Alexandria, and that was a hot spot regionally of Greek philosophy, of Hellenistic indoctrination. And you even had Jews that were trying to 
um, syncretize or mix biblical worldview with a Greek philosoph philosophical worldview. Likewise, the early church did the same thing. They were called the Gnostics. Now, they took it to kind of an extreme, but the Gnostic movement was just that. It was an effort to mix what the Bible teaches with what Greek philosophy teaches. What does Paul the Apostle say? In Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, he says, Beware, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. What's he talking about? He's talking about Greek philosophy. It was the prevailing philosophy of the time. Again, this pagan influence. He says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. He calls it empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, not according to the tradition of God. According to the basic principles of this world, not according to Christ, not according to Messiah. And then he adds this interesting statement, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Why does he say that? Again, because the Greek philosophers did not like the concept of the incarnation, that the divine would take on flesh. Why would he lower himself? The goal is in the other direction. We are to escape the flesh, to become spirit. The spirit doesn't take on flesh. That's anathema to the Greek philosophy. And Paul goes, no, 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 listen. That whole system has it completely wrong. God took on flesh, okay? So that's, that's a starting point. It's, it's important to note that Paul specifically identified, specified, and warned the church against this empty deceit according to the basic principles of man and not God. Okay, so now here is a, another chart, if you will, to introduce the Jewish or the Hebrew worldview. Okay, so from a biblical perspective, from a Hebrew Jewish biblical perspective, in the beginning, right? In the beginning, God created what? He created the heavens and the earth. Note the heavens are plural, it's not heaven and earth. The heavens and the earth. Okay, so that's the sky, it's space, it's the spirit realm, and it's heaven. When we say heaven, we think the place where God dwells, the throne of God, he is presently there, okay? And he created the earth, and it was all good. Earth was good, heaven was good, God made it all in the beginning, right? It's not earth is bad, heaven is good. Okay, so when the gospel is mixed with, or when it's corrupted by Greek philosophical worldview, then it's essentially, the idea is essentially that our goal as Christians is to someday die. Someday die and then just go to heaven. So I've just got a picture here. This was uh, popular really back in the 90s, you know, different local fairs and different things where churches would set up. And I actually did this myself back when I was doing campus ministry, set up a big uh, banner that says, are you going to heaven? Everybody wants to go up and talk about the, well, am I going to, what do you say? Do you say, I'm going to, and they do a basic test, and it's just to determine whether or not they believe in Jesus. And if they do, you say, hey, you're going to heaven. If you reject Jesus, then you say, according to the Bible, the Bible says you're not going to heaven. But notice that the goal of the gospel is what? To go to heaven forever. The gospel that says the primary goal of Christianity is to someday die and go to heaven forever is the result of a mixture of Greek philosophy with the gospel. That's not actually biblical hope. It's not what the Bible teaches as the end goal of the believer. It's not to someday become a spirit or a ghost forever in heaven, even though that's often essentially what's taught. What the Bible actually does teach, what the Bible actually does teach, is that we are awaiting the, res the restoration of all things, the redemption of what? Our bodies. The resurrection of the dead. It's not to escape the shell. It's for God to heal and restore and renew the earth according to as it was in the Garden of Eden. So the plan of redemption, the goal of redemption, is not to destroy the physical or not to escape the physical, but to heal and restore the, the, the physical realm, the earthly realm, as it was in the beginning when everything was good. Now, according to the Bible, um, the heavens are actually corrupt as well. Satan actually dwells. I mean, he's accusing us before the throne day and night. Like, there's corruption in the, in the heavenly realm. There are evil, wicked principalities in the spiritual realm that are governing the earth. So there's corruption both on earth and in heaven. And his plan is to redeem and purify and purge all of the above and ultimately bring the two together. We'll talk about that some more. So Romans 8, verse 22 and 23, it says, We know that the whole creation, all of creation, again, that's 
the heavens and the earth, the whole creation, groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. There is this ongoing yearning, this ongoing waiting, this Maranatha cry, Come, Lord Jesus, how long, O Lord, how long, O Lord, arise, O Lord, and come down. All of creation is crying and waiting and groaning, right? And not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit within us. God Himself, it says, is groaning within us, waiting for our adoption as sons. That's ultimately the restoration of all things. Paul says this, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, so the gospel is not just God save our souls so that someday our souls go to heaven, our spirits go to heaven. The ultimate goal of the gospel is the redemption of our spirits and our bodies, the totality of who we are. Okay, now to be clear, if we were to die today, our spirits would be alive and would be with him in heaven. Okay, I want to be clear. But even those who are in heaven are awaiting this particular moment in time, this appointed time referred to as the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, when our spirits will be united with our redeemed, restored, immortal, eternal bodies. Okay, that's what the Bible teaches. So according to the Hebrew, the Jewish, or the biblical worldview, the eternal purpose and plan of God is this. It's very simple. God is faithful to his creation. In the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. He will redeem, restore, and heal his entire creation, the whole creation, as Romans 8 says. He will redeem the heavens and the earth together under his headship. That's the goal. That's where it's all heading. So now what I've done is created a timeline. Again, we saw the Greek philosophical timeline. Things that we're just spiraling through time, kind of going around and around and around. It's not really moving toward anything. From a biblical perspective, okay, there is a beginning. What is the beginning? Creation. The beginning of the Bible. It begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created all things. And so I've put a C there for creation. That's the starting point. According to the biblical worldview, time is linear. It has a beginning and it's moving toward a very specific, a specified time period. Okay, it's moving forward. Now, from a biblical perspective, there is a degree, I'll even say this just to complicate it, to where we are sort of spiraling toward that goal. In other words, history does to a degree repeat itself. There are events in the Bible within Israel's history that, that they become repeated and sort of this foreshadows and that type of thing, but it is moving toward a very a very specific uh, moment in time, ultimately the return of Jesus, the day of the Lord, the establishment of his kingdom, what the Bible calls the age to come. We'll unpack that some more. Uh, but then I've got the fall, that's the F, okay, shortly after creation you had the fall, and then I've got AMD, that means the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, and the Davidic, okay, so this is the period of the covenants, Then of course you had the prophets, then I've got the cross there, and I've got an end for the new covenant, okay, and the new covenant was was cut, it was made at the cross, but it will culminate when he returns. Okay, so we're in this period now, in between the cross and his return. So you've got Jesus coming down from heaven, and that is the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, and then the R stands for the restoration of all things. Okay, so that's, that's where the, the Bible says things are heading. And we can look at this timeline, we can say, we are here, we are right here, this is where we are, and this is what the future holds. There's a very specific beginning point and a very specific destination, a culmination. We're heading in that direction. Okay, so uh, as it says in the book of Revelation, again, just to reiterate this whole concept, Revelation chapter 21, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, okay, heavenly city coming down, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Notice it's not that we're going up there forever. It's actually heaven is coming down to the earth as one under his headship. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling of God, the tabernacle of God is now among men. It has come down and he will dwell amongst them. They will be his people. God himself will be among them. Can you think of, imagine that the God of all creation has chosen to live with us, not outside of time, not outside of creation, not just within creation. Right now it says that he, his throne is at the height of the heavens. 
but he's still within creation. But his goal is actually to be our neighbors, <laughs> to live with us, together with us. And that's very literal. On the earth, his dwelling is with men. Uh, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death, no longer mourning, crying, or pain. We're all looking forward to that time. He says the, these former things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. I am making all things new. So this is the goal. This is the destination. This is the plan, the purpose plan of God. It's moving toward the restoration of all things when he will make all things new. Likewise, as it says in Colossians 1, 19 and 20, it pleased the Father. It pleased the Father that in him, that's Jesus, all the fullness of the Godhead should dwell. The fullness of the Godhead dwelling in the flesh of the Messiah for by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. There it is. Everything on the earth and heaven, everything will be healed and reconciled because of the cross. The cross was not just to save our souls. It was to restore all of God's creation, things both in heaven and on earth. Likewise, Ephesians 1 verse 10 says, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he, that's Christ, might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. And likewise, in Acts chapter 3, 19 through 21, Peter issues this call to repent to his fellow countrymen, and he ends by saying, in order that the Lord would send the Messiah, and the period of the restoration of all things will finally come about which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. This is where everything is pointing, where everything is moving, the restoration of all things in heaven and on earth. Okay, so we've got that concept. Now, here's another chart. I'll park here for a minute just, so, just to unpack it. Again, we've got the biblical timeline. In the beginning, you can see the three H's. God created the heavens and the earth. That's the, the white circle is kind of the totality of everything that God created. In the cre beginning, he created the heavens and the earth, and that sort of defines everything that he's made. And you can take that ball, that circle, and just move it forward any place on the timeline. But that's how it was in the beginning. But as we're presently, okay, from creation, actually up until his return, we are in something the Bible refers to as this age. So this is the primary way that the Bible defines time. There are two ages, two primary periods, this age and the age to come. Okay, this age and the age to come. And it's, it's defined by a def decisive event. It's divided by a decisive event, which is the return of Jesus. Okay, so we've talked about a Jewish worldview, but what does the Bible teach as it relates to the issue of apocalypticism. And apocalyptic is a very technical sort of academic term. Okay, it refers to a particular type of literature that was very popular in the first century, second temple Jewish period. And it's also a, a way of viewing, again, history. So from an apocalyptic perspective, again, biblical apocalyptic perspective, apocalyptic doesn't just mean like cataclysmic, like the apocalypse is coming. The apocalypse refers to that decisive event that separates this age from the age to come. The Bible teaches that we are now in this age. From creation, from the time of the fall, until the time that he returns, creation is subject to futility. It's corrupt. It's fallen. We are sinful beings. We experience death. We have to bring forth fruit from the earth through the toil of our brow. This type of thing, right? Childbirth is painful for women etc., etc. There's so much that comes with it. The governing principalities, spiritually and otherwise, are corrupt, like the world is unjust. That's this age. We're dying in this age. In the age to come, however, after he returns and his kingdom is established on the earth as the throne of his father David is reestablished, the age to come will be defined by the healing, the restoration, the redemption of all things. And what we refer to as the millennium, what the Bible refers to as the millennium, is really the transition into the ultimate eternal state. The millennium is a transition, a transitionary period from this age into the age, the, uh, the new heavens and the new earth, so to speak. Okay, so that's, 
sort of a brief overview. Now, what I've done here is made another chart, and you can see that at the day of the Lord, when Jesus returns, I've got a scroll there, that's with the R on it, that's the book of Revelation. Okay, so when we talk about the book of Revelation within the context of a Jewish apocalyptic worldview, the book of Revelation is specifically talking about the events that surround the revelation, the return, the coming of Jesus. The return of Jesus is the decisive event, the pinnacle of all Jewish hope, all biblical hope and expectation. And the book of Revelation describes and talks about the events that precedes and actually follows his return, that surround his return. It's primarily concerned with the seven years leading up to his return, as well as his return, and then the establishment of his millennial kingdom that will be established after he returns. Now, the book of Revelation also has tremendous pastoral um, relevance to us today. I, I want to be clear, it's not only for those that will live within that final period. It is a book that is beneficial, it's a blessing for everyone. However, the primary chronology, the timing of what it's focused on, again, are the events that surround his return. So you can see that's where the book fits. The book of Revelation is not just speaking broadly of church history. Um, that's sort of a uh, idealistic um, interpretation. It's not just speaking generally, metaphorically. That's the spiritual interpretation. The book of Revelation is to be understood through a pre-millennial framework. Again, a Jewish apocalyptic framework, which is to say it is speaking of that transitionary period, the culmination of history, the transition from this age into the age to come. And then finally, we've talked about the Jewish worldview. We've, ta we've talked about the apocalyptic understanding of time. Now let's talk about cruciform. Okay, so cruciform is um, essentially a term that just simply means patterned after the cross. It's, it's patterned after the, you could say it's shaped like the cross, but that's a little bit confusing. But essentially history, okay, the, the, this age that we're in right now, that as followers of Jesus, this age is defined by our embrace of the cross. This age that we're in is patterned after the cross. The lives that we as followers of Jesus live is to emulate, to imitate the pattern left behind by Jesus. And then after he returns, we inherit glory. So the idea is it's cross, suffering, death, martyrdom, laying down our lives, taking up our cross before glory. So in the same way that we can look at a chart and say, the Bible says that there's this age and the age to come, you can also say the Bible says there is suffering before glory. And what the book of Revelation does is it speaks of this moment in time, this culmination of history, when the church, more than any other time in history, will, will model that lifestyle, will embrace that lifestyle, will taste that lifestyle, will embrace and bear witness concerning their master, whom they claim to be, who we claim to be imitating, which is laying down our lives as martyr witnesses. One final grand witness when the church will have the opportunity to demonstrate the mercy of God to largely unrepentant sinners. So let's look at just a few verses. Now again, this is so important because in the church today, the the model is essentially taught that Jesus died on the cross so that we don't have to suffer. I actually heard someone at a political rally uh, last night, just before recording this, and he said this. He said, Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we would be failures. He died on the cross for our victory. And then he applied that to saying we need to conquer politically in the United States. So that's very much the Constantinian model, right? Allegedly, Constantine had this vision where he saw the cross and he heard the words, by this sign do conquer. So what did he do? He put it on the front of the shields of his armies and they attacked the pagans, right? Through the symbol or the idea of the cross, we kill the unbelievers. That's fundamentally perverse. The Bible teaches, no, we embrace the cross and lay down our lives 
for the wicked, because that's exactly what he did for us. For all of us once were his enemies, and he embraced torture, mutilation, and death in order to make us who, are his, who were his enemies into his children. Think about that. And then he says, imitate me, imitate me. And this is true throughout all of church history. It's true today, but there's a time when it will culminate, when there will be a crescendo, an ultimate time of trial, a trial and opportunity that will come upon the church. Luke 24, verse 25 through 26. O oh, foolish men, Jesus says, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, like, don't, aren't you guys familiar with what all the prophets have been saying all along? Was it not necessary for the Messiah, for the Christ, to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Okay, so Jesus left us a pattern, an example, a model, suffering before glory. He says, don't you understand what the prophets have been saying all along? It was necessary that I would suffer first in this life, in this age, and then after that, enter glory. Now, he was the first fruits, right? Some people will say, but, well, he did that so we don't have to. What else do the scriptures say? Let's look at a few different verses. First Peter, chapter 1, 6 through 9. Peter says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, temporarily, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. Why? So that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, which perishes, which can burn up, though it's tested by fire, so that your faith may be found to result in praise, honor, and glory. When? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. When will this praise, honor, and glory, when we, will we receive it if we lay down our lives patiently now? At the revelation. The book of Revelation is focused on, the, the term, by the way, in the Greek is apocalypsis, the revealing, when he is revealed from heaven. That is when. The true testing of your faith will prove true, resulting in praise, honor, and glory. Though you don't see him now, you still believe. Even though he's essentially invisible, you believe. You rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We will, we're receiving it now. We're in the process of receiving it, but we will ultimately receive it when he is revealed from heaven. Likewise, 1 Peter chapter 2, and this is so critical, verses 21 through 24. Again, Jesus suffered these things and then entered glory according to all that the prophets have spoken. And we, as 1 Peter says, says, for you have been called for this purpose. Who? Us, you and me. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you who are watching this, you and me, we have been called for this purpose. Since Christ suffered for you and me, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Christians throughout history, we're not called to conquer the world by the cross. We're called to lay down our lives and preach the gospel, okay, and quite possibly literally, for others, for our enemies, for wicked reprobate sinners, because he left us a pattern, an example, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. It goes on, it says, he committed no sin. In other words, he was innocent. He didn't deserve what he got. Nor was any deceit found in his mouth. While being reviled, he didn't revile in return. He didn't talk smack back. He let the sinners mock him and revile. He didn't speak back. While suffering, he uttered no threats. He simply kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds we are healed. And then finally... Revelation 6, and this is something that we'll talk much more about as we do jump into the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 6. What is creation waiting for? Well, we would say that all of creation needs to hear the gospel, right? This gospel will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So missiologists talk about this. We need to complete the Great Commission, and then Jesus will return. That's true. It says so. Well, there's something else that needs to be filled up, that needs to be completed before he will return. And that's something that very few people talk about it. And this is really at the center of the book of Revelation. It's not just about the revelation of Jesus, but it's ultimately about the revelation of him in his church. Again, as we bear witness, as we model and point back to him, point to who he is. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, this is Revelation 6, verse 9, I saw underneath the altar 
of the souls of those who had been slain. So in the last days, those in the church, it says they will be slain, they will be killed. Why? Because the word of God, because of the testimony which they had maintained, they had held firm to. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, Oh Lord, how long, holy and true, until you, uh, how long will you continue to refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each one a white robe. And they were told they should rest for a little while longer, just a little while longer. Again, this final three and a half year period of tribulation until, until what? Until the number of their fellow servants, their brethren, who were to be killed even as they had been, would be completed also. The book of Revelation talks about this culmination, this final period when the church will fill up the full number of martyrs when we will embrace a cruciform message, a, a cross-centered message, a message that is modeled after the cross as we imitate our master who embraced the cross, embraced it for the joy. He scorned it, but for the joy set before him and in order that he could redeem a mighty host, right? So Jewish, apocalyptic, cruciform. And if we miss any one of these things, we're gonna misinterpret the book of Revelation. We need to understand where it sits within, uh, again, just the Jewish understanding of the unfolding of history. It's the culmination. It's the capstone. It comes at the end of the Bible for a reason. It's amazing to think that some of the reformers, Martin Luther actually, and others, didn't even want it in the canon. Like it was so confusing. And, and sometimes by the way that many in the modern church relate to the book of Revelation, you go, gosh, do they even want it? Do they even believe it's the word of God? Absolutely. It is the capstone of the entire testimony. Everything has been moving toward this book, and it's a privilege and a joy to be able to jump into it. So hopefully that helps, um, again, contextualize this, this glorious book that we're going to jump into. So next week, Dalton's going to jump in. We're going to begin the actual exposition, uh, begin working through. And again, we don't know how long it's going to go, but we're excited. So amen and amen. That's all the time that we have for this session. Look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, God bless and Maranatha.